which is uh, year 2001, where the uh, draft sequence of the human genome was published. And uh, there were quite a bit of surprises, not the lines, three billion base, base pairs or letters. And the human genome consists of four different letters. And this took five years, around three and a half billion dollars to produce one genome. And um, since then, the process, if you look at the cost of DNA sequencing, it came down exponentially to the extent that now we can sequence a genome around three or four thousand dollars in around two months. In other words, if you look at some of the original machines that were used for this production of the first human genome, there were 250 machines. It took them one year. And if you look at the recently formed uh, Yale Center for Genome Analysis, now we can produce that in one, using one machine instead of 250 and using one week. So the whole process actually got around 10 million times more efficient, cost efficient and time efficient in the last 10 years. If you compare you and me, we are all 99% identical. But there's variation. And initially we thought the variation only existed at the single letter level. One letter out of three billion can determine a major risk for a disease. But it turns out that the human genome is not that stable. Despite single base changes, there are also large size gains and losses, deletions or duplications. And these variation can be common in the sense that this is population specific, but in some populations, a variation can be seen in 20% of people. And that can, for example, affect the risk for cardiovascular disorders. But here the key word is effect, effect size. For example, Watson, who discovered the structure of the DNA, was one of the first people whose DNA was sequenced. He gave permission for the DNA to be sequenced except the Alzheimer risk locus. The reason for that is that if you have a specific variation there, the likelihood that you would develop Alzheimer's is hundredfold higher. And he did not want to know that, but he sequenced everything else. So it really is, um, is a question that we're going to be faced more and more. To make it more complicated, the, the variation can be at the germ line, so it can be transmitted, or that can happen in the tissue level, such as cancer, and we'll talk about these. Um, I'm mainly going to use, um, try to give a sort of an overall view, and I, I apologize from my colleagues in biomedical sciences um, how untechnical and basic my talk is. And I also apologize to people in non-biomedical sciences how technical it is. So it's, it's hard, to find, um, hard to find a common ground, but I'll try to, again, to make it entertaining, ma make some bold predictions. There are good news and bad news. The good news is that you all are going to live longer. The bad news is that you all might be happily demented on this view of neurodegenerative diseases. I think I will try to convince you today that we are making significant advances in, uh, in solving diseases. And as you can imagine, in treatment, the first key question is a mechanistic insight into disease pathophysiology. If you can understand it, you can fight it. And just for simplification purposes, I'm going to divide the diseases that we're dealing with into three forms. One of the, the first one is the familial form. For example, if you have a 20-member uh, family and 10 of them are affected with say heart attacks, then you have a Mendelian or familial form of heart attacks. If you have a 20 member family and one or two people have heart attacks, then you're dealing with a common disease such as heart attacks or coronary artery disease in the population that is also affecting the, your family. And the genetic model, the genetic mechanisms underlying those disorders are different. In the familial diseases, there's one letter difference. There might be one letter difference in that three billion that we mentioned but that has a significant effect on the disease risk, such as the Alzheimer's locus that we talked about. In common disorders, there are common variation in the population at a specific letter. You can have an A, I can have a C, and let's say that A is seen in 20% of population, and that increases the heart attack risk only to a modest degree, say one and a half fold, as opposed to 100 fold. And with the recent advances in these gene sequencing, genomic sequencing technologies, now we are understanding this variation and we're making bold predictions. And we're now applying them to clinical medicine, especially in cancer, as I will mention. So let's take these one by one. Let's get some examples. Being a neurosurgeon and everything else, I'm fascinated about human brain. People have called it the, the final frontier, the crown jewel of creation. No matter what you call it, it's a fascinating structure. And we are at our very early stages of understanding the human brain. As you can imagine, one of the ways to look at that is to look at the diseases that affect brain, especially formation of the brain. It's hard to imagine 
that a single letter, and as you will see the examples, in that three billion letters can affect formation of this incredible structure to this degree. And it's also unfortunate, and I always say this, it's still shame for Turkey that because of consanguineous marriages that we have so-called recessive forms of this disease. That means that for all those three billion letters, we have two copies that comes from mom and dad, and these severe disorders only form if the same um, problem exists on both copies of the same gene. So if you, that only happens, statistically speaking, or most likely to happen if the parents are related to each other. So this also represents actually our largest collaboration with Turkey, studying these structural brain disorders and trying to understand the genes that are important in human brain development and how do they affect the formation of the brain. This obviously has significant implications not only for basic sciences and a fundamental understanding, which is good enough, but also might have implications for treatment of various other disorders, including neurodegenerative disorders. The um, journey starts with, uh, with identification of the affected individual, followed by identif identification of that, um, 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 if I could use a term in Turkish, trying to find a needle in the haystack. And then you identify the one um, difference that these people have to identify the disease risk, then understand the function of the gene, create model systems, which I'm sure Gökhan is the, uh, the master of that, and he will talk about that, to, so that he can understand the mechanisms and pathways underlying disorders, and ultimately, of course, we all aim to have better treatment. Here is a dramatic example, actually. This is from a family from Elazığ. The kids are born normally. They grow, but they become blind at an early age, at age two, and then they have these significant neurological problems, and the parents are first cousins, and there are three of them. And if you think about the um, human, human development is this, in this fascinating structure, just very basic schematically, so that it will um, form the basis for further discussion, in embryonic development, these neural stem cells are next to these fluid-filled spaces called the ventricles. And they, they are formed, the stem cells are formed in the center of the brain, as shown here, underlying these fluid-filled structures, the ventricular zone, and they migrate. They migrate to the surface in a very elaborate fashion such that the human cortex, which is six layers, is the only six-layer cortex in the animal kingdom, forms in an inside-out fashion. So all these guys, the new stem cells, have to pass in between the other ones to reach the, to reach the surface. And again, our idea is to use these um, unfortunate kids and to, to understand how the human brain forms. So far, a lot of studies in this and other Mendelian familial forms of disease have gone, but we were limited with the genetic technology. If you think about 20,000 genes, just let's make very rough estimations. There's, let's say, 20,000 diseases related to each gene, but there's significant heterogeneity, which I won't get into. And let's say that half of them, we already know, or they are lethal during embryonic development. That means we have to find 10,000 disease genes. We only know a few thousand. So NIH has started this big, big program, Mendelian Disease Center, putting $50 million into it. In the next five years, we predict we will identify most of the remaining disease genes and basically double the amount of knowledge that we already have in the next five years of what we had for the last centuries. The problem has been that there's typically, with this and other familial diseases, early childhood mortality, and there's typically single effectors in the families, and as I said, one disease gene, one, uh, I should say one mutation can cause many different diseases and many different diseases can be caused by the same gene. So it gets complicated. But let's use some specific examples from my lab. Here is a uh, so-called MRI scan. You're looking at the um, axial cut from a, a, a controlled brain. And next to that, same age, compare this brain. This is a family that was referred from Jarakbasha. You can see how much smaller the brain is. Well, also one fascinating aspect that it's incredible that we still don't understand, but the human brain surface have convolutions, which the basic idea is that cortex is on the surface, increases surface area, increases inter intelligence and cognitive capacity, but the molecular pathways leading to that surface convolutions are not understood. But it's dramatically different, this little child's brain. As I said, this is a, the, um, if you look at this family, this is a first cousin marriage and there are two cousins that are affected. And again, traditional uh, linkage or other genetic approaches won't um, give you enough power to understand that. But let's again think about the technologies, what has happened. We said there's 20,000 genes that account for 1% of the genome, and mutations in these regions have major effects on diseases. So the current thinking is that 
the mutations or the variation in that one person of the genome account for 80 to 90 percent of all familial disease. So we at Yale, along with Rick Lifton and Matt State, who are my colleagues, said that why don't we try to focus on a technology that sequences, that get, re, gets read out only from this one percent instead of trying to get all three billion letters uh, um, read. So this is selective sequencing of all genes or protein coding, um, uh, um, protein coding um, region of the genome. And of course, this has significant implications. The idea is very simple. You take the total DNA, you shear it, you hybridize it, you, you stick it into either microchips or in solution, you select what you want to uh, sequence, and then you read it. The end result, after, after many months of work, is this. Out of three billion letters, these four are gone in that child. And that leads to that disease. That, of course, leads to a frame shift, leads to a stop in the protein, as shown in X here. So that protein is gone. Genetics is basically an art of statistics that you have. There's always these probabilities. I'm not a quantum physicist. I hate to make the correlation, but somewhat resembles that quantum physics that you can only get probabilities. You can never be certain. And um, of course, especially after one incidence, you're never certain. So we went back to our cohort, and we found um, many more mutations. As you can see, again, the families are really small. That tells you that these mutations or problems with this protein leads to human brain malformations. Doesn't tell you anything about the function. There was only one article that was published about this protein. So we did studies to understand it. I won't go into those studies which are still ongoing, except here, if you can again look at the VZ here, which is the ventricular zone, these are some cells stained colorfully. Here's a marker that stains stem cells. Here's our protein in red, and here's a composite image in, in, in yellow suggesting that this gene actually is fundamental in neural stem cell uh, function, which again, I won't go into that. And it leads, to make it more complicated, to all these different MRI pictures here. Not one brain looks like the other, like this one has a huge cleft, which has significance. This one has other uh, formation of the convolution. So this one mutation, or, or these mutations in this one, one, one gene, can lead to all this spectrum of disorders. So, this was published, and I'm proud of this paper because there is input from over 11 institutions in Turkey. And this was a really joint, um, joint work. And uh, Dr. Alberts and his uh, collaborators were kind, for, uh, kind enough to choose that as one of the breakthroughs for the um, scientific discovery in, in 2010, this exome sequencing, where they have seen actually the impact of this, especially in understanding the genetic basis of Mendelian disorders or the disorders that run in families. But that doesn't end there, actually. This technology also allows us to gain unique insight into these diseases that are seen commonly in the population. Again, we talked about heart attacks, diabetes, hypertension, asthma, you name it, and pretty much actually everything. And the disease that we work on in my lab is, is brain aneurysms, being a neurosurgeon, which um, are these balloon-like dilations in the blood vessels. And these, of course, lead to uh, unfortunate brain bleeds that are usually lethal. They are common in the population. They're 2 to 5 percent um, prevalence. And unfortunately, when it ruptures, half of the people don't survive, typically in the age, young ages of 40 to 60. And there's really no way to identify these individuals. So we thought that we could look at the genetic variation in the genome of these individuals and compare them to controls like has been done in many other diseases, and identify disease risk locus. And we've done this by just looking at the areas, points, that are known to be different among all of us, so-called genome-wide association study. And so far, we have completed three of them and um, have identified eight different regions that contains these genes. And the names are not important. The important, one, the important thing is that now these allow us to gain novel biological insight on how aneurysms form so that we can think about not only early diagnosis but also treatment. When you look at, this is the only, I promise, this is the only surgical slide, there's no blood. And if you look at these aneurysms, and this is actually just behind the eye, you can see the optic nerve that makes you see. Here's the carotid artery, and here's the aneurysm that's sticking out this balloon here. Look at this blood vessel, it looks healthy, it looks pink, it, it's pulsatile, it's elastic when you touch it. Compare that to this, the same thing, optic nerve, carotid. Here's the dis disformed aneurysm. Look at the white streak artifact on it. So this is hardening of the blood vessels, so atherosclerotic mechanism. So but by using genetics, now we have at least an understanding 
of, of molecular subclassification of how these can form, but this only gave, after studying 20,000 people's DNA, 6,000 affected, and 14,000 controls, we gained insight into less than 10% of genetic variation. 90%, we still don't know. We think it lies in the protein coding regions of the genome, so the studies of, of sequencing those areas are ongoing now. I think the other point here to make, uh, what we've been discussing since the morning session, which is science is now global. There are no borders. I literally had to go twice around the world to get these samples. And when we published the second study, there were 69 authors from 32 institutions in 12 countries. And that's what it takes right now to reach that. But ultimately, as I said, we want to understand the individuals who are at risk of forming aneurysms so that we can intervene before it happens. And for the first time, we can at least think of some novel therapeutic approaches other than the barbarian way, which I love, which is surgery. So, so we're looking into that. So, so far we talked about the inherited types of mutation, but I think the, the, one, the one thing, I know my colleagues make, I, I'm, I'm sure I'll be wrong, but the one, I think, disease area that will, we will have significant impact very shortly is, is, is cancer. And the largest studies right now in the U.S., the largest sequencing studies are going on in understanding the cancer genome. Cancer can be inherited in certain families. That's rare. What happens is that at the tissue level, one cell, just a single cell, acquire variation, acquire mutations that gives them a cancer. And we focus on brain tumors. And if you think about brain tumors, meningiomas are the most common benign ones, but the deadly one is a glial tumor called glioblastoma, or GBM where the life expectancy is still less than a year, median life expectancy. So we need to understand that because there has been significant number of studies, and this is a busy slide, I don't mean to say anything with it, other than to say that the proteins that play a role in glioblastoma formation have somewhat been understood, but there has been, we did not have this technology when these studies are being done. And um, right now, if you think about uh, treatment, there is a standard treatment that everybody gets. You get surgery, you get radiation, and you are given the same drug. Doesn't matter what you have, because the, the diagnosis is made under live microscopy looking at the cell type. But now this next generation sequencing technologies that I've been talking about allows us to molecularly subclassify these tumors and hopefully start giving, which we started at Yale, so, so did other, some other institutions in the US, a, a chemotherapy specific for the mutations that are carried by this, by this tumor. The best example being the breast cancer where now if you have a specific variation, you can, you can think about cure. So um, this is one of the largest studies that are being done in the world along with the Cancer Genome Atlas where we take the, um, the tumors from surgery, we sequence not only at the exome level for cancer, the, besides the protein coding regions, the remaining 2.999 billion is also important, so we do whole genome sequencing. And I'll just show you one example to, just to make the point. This is so-called a circus plot that shows what is wrong with this tumor's um, DNA compared to normal tissue. All three billion letters are represented here with the chromosomes. The, uh, the most outside circle is the point variation, those single letter uh, variation. But in cancer, what's also important is the copy numbers. We all said we have two copies, but in cancer that changes uh, significantly. And these, um, these um, orange lines represent gene fusion or translocation or exchange events between very distant areas, different, different chromosomes. And I'll show you this map. This is blood, actually, of two tumors. This is, both of them are called glioblastoma. You look under light microscopy, it looks the same. Look how different they are in, in terms of the genomic uh, stability. Here's the um, number of point mutations, but look how much uh, events are happening across chromosomes and how unstable this, this genome is. And we're treating still these individuals the same way, which doesn't make sense. There's, uh, there are complicated areas. We're looking at which molecule is affected, what is activated, and basically giving individualized treatments. So to, to summarize, if you think about the, what, again, might happen due to use of these genomic technologies, in medicine right now, we wait till the symptoms develop which is we, we react to the symptoms when the disease develops. We make the diagnosis. We're never wrong, but some people are. And then we, we, uh, if you make the misdiagnosis, you give the mistreatment. So there's a trial and error until you get a response. So we have very little insight, especially in individual disease. What's now happening is that we can identify, as I said, and with years, this, this information is going to explode. We can understand the baseline risk. We can understand 
whether you're at risk for, let's say, forming colon cancer after age 40. We can do preventive measures to that. We can do lifestyle recommendations if you're at risk for cardiovascular disease. We can do early risk assessment, and we can, we can treat you early before the disease happens. If you fail, as the disease happens, we know your tendencies, we know what you're likely to develop. We can make the early correct diagnosis, we can give the um, therapy, and we can do the therapy that we know you would respond, or have li a higher likelihood of responding. And we can give you individualized treatment. And I think we are right there. So application of these technologies really have significant impact now, understanding different diseases, understanding mechanisms underlying diseases, um, going for preclinical diagnosis, but treatment, and most importantly, probably individualized, individualized treatment. This comes at a price. It's not easy. I'm going to ask you how many of you would, um, would want to know. What if I tell you that you're going to develop Parkinson's disease? Do you know who that happened to? Google is now making big investments into, um, into genetics, 23andMe. And um, uh, Sergey, um, what's his last name? Was he found through his wife, who's the uh, heading 23andMe, and this is public knowledge, that he's going to develop Parkinson's disease with a, with a variation that's almost 100%. So really bad news for him because there's no treatment. Good news for research because now hundreds of millions of dollars, well, tens of millions, I would say, probably going to Parkinson's research. So it really is not that easy. Who should we sequence? When we should we sequence? How do you share the data? How do we share the data if we don't understand ourselves with other people? There's also a significant economic impact of these. And if you look at this, is this um, the, the cover of Forbes, um, we were talking last night, a couple months ago, the next billion dollar industry is going to be the sequencing technology in industry. And um, don't think that other people are not thinking about that. This is a... Um, uh, experts from the, um, um, the column of Tom Friedman, where he talks about China and their moonshots, multi-billion dollar investments. They are investing in ultra-modern airports, high-speed trains, electric car industries, and now they've formed the world's largest genomics institute. So there's really, this will have significant impact in our future. It's already having an impact. That's a bold prediction that diseases like cancer, we're gonna start curing certain types even for, for GBMs. So in the last minute, actually, um, I, I think, um, Doron, did you bring it up or, or uh, Kemal brought it up? But we talked about Turks being close to Mexicans and the Latin people. So in our study so far, we have analyzed um, over 990 Turkish genomes through genotyping. And this is a basic graph. I'll get into detail in, in a minute. But by looking at that, you can actually put populations as a structure in, in a world map, which has been done extensively for U.S. populations and European populations. So we've done that for the Turkish, um, Turkish samples. And this is limited with the um, number of, of course, populations that you put into the study. This is, there's a large effort going on, HapMap, which is mapping all world populations. And what, what have been used in the third version of that is, is shown here. And um, here I'll just um, mention a couple of them. For example, you can see the Africans, you can see the Asians. Uh, you can see some American Indians, you can see Mexicans, and you can see uh, Italians from Tuscany. Here, the Turks are shown in, in, in red, and guess who, who we are closest to? Daron, who do you think? <laughs> Just take a guess. Very good, okay. Well, we are closest to, um, actually, um, uh, Italians, to Tuscany Italians. <laughs> So here is the, um, here is the, um, tell me, the uh, Turks. Here actually are the Italians, which are very close. In other dimensions, this is multi-dimensional um, scale, which I won't go into that, but you can see it, this most significant dimensions, Turks are fairly close to Italians. Here's actually the rest of Europe. And this is the surprise part. The purple here is the um, Gujarati Indians from Houston, Texas. <laughs> it might be an artifact, I don't know. So I think um, I'll stop there, and um, thank you very much. Thank you, Gokhan, and thank you, the organizers, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, what Murat didn't tell you is uh, he told you the good and the bad. But uh, as far as I remember, Clint Eastwood's mo uh, movie was called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. <laughs> and uh, so I am the guy who's going to talk about the ugly. 
And uh, so I will talk about cancer. And uh, so uh, just to make you feel even more depressed and dementia, and uh, one in two men in their lifetime and one in three women in their lifetime will be diagnosed with cancer. So the statistics are pretty bad. Quarter of all deaths in the United States are because of cancer. If you take a jumbo jet and three of them every day and bang it into a wall and they crash, that's the number of people die every day in, a, uh, in the United States, about 1,500 people. And so it's a major disease. And uh, when my good friend Gokan said, uh, I asked him last night, I said, what's the most ancient slide you're going to show? And he said, I'm going to go around 1,700. So I immediately put my first slide. It has no, bear <laughs> it has no bearing to this talk, but it goes uh, earlier. Uh, this is the first known uh, report on uh, cancer, uh, Imhotep in uh, 2600 some BC. And uh, with the importance of it, actually, in those years, uh, people thought ancient Egypt, uh, they uh, were treating cancer as a magical thing. But it is not. In fact, it had, in this book, 45th uh, uh, case study out of 48 uh, papyrus. And uh, for cancer, he says, uh, there is no therapy. And that's the, what we are trying to change here. And there are quite a few things happening. But the real credit goes to, as you all know, uh, 460 uh, BC. Hippocrates was the uh, person who came up with the title uh, for cancer. And the reason cancer is called cancer, karkinos, and there's going to be a lot of Greek learning here today. It's a Turkish meeting. And uh, karkinos. <laughs> Karkinos, uh, because uh, uh, at those years, people didn't live very long. Uh, they, typically, they were superficial cancers, such as breast cancer. And the way the cancer looked uh, like a crab, the animal crab. So karkinos means crab. And so thank God, if it looked like a monkey, it would have been a memo. And that's my nickname, so that would be very uncomfortable. <laughs> The big issue here, he came up with these four humors. He said the diseases are caused by balances or misbalances of these four humors. And uh, the uh, film is the uh, mucus stuff, tuberculosis, and all those kind of diseases. Yellow bile is yellow bile, uh, uh, cholera, and uh, uh, jaundice, and those diseases. Of course, the blood. There's also that black bile. The black bile is uh, in Greek. Uh, m means a melancholy. Melan, black, a uh, uh, is uh, bile. And in fact, even those days, uh, depression and cancer were related to each other. And that's why that guy looks really sad and ugly. And uh, uh, the person who made this uh, very popularized uh, came a few hundred years later. And uh, that's uh, Claudius Gallen. And in fact, he, he lived in Pergamon. So, He's Turkish, <laughs> by association. And, uh, and he really worked on this for, but it has always been difficult to show the black pile. The others they could discover and show, but they could never show the black pile. Where is it? The tumor, when you look at it, uh, look black, and, uh, but there's no black pile. And it, so it took another 15 some hundred years uh, until a very famous uh, uh, person who uh, created the modern anatomy, uh, Vesalius. And uh, before that, it, it, it was uh, banned to do uh, autopsies uh, uh, on humans. So most of the information came from animals. But uh, he started doing uh, uh, autopsies on uh, humans and a lot of the anatomy we know today comes from his early working, he couldn't find a black bile. So he was disappointed because he was coming from Gallen's school of thought. And uh, so he didn't publish as I didn't find it, but uh, he also didn't say I found it. And uh, after that, uh, it took another uh, multiple years, hundreds of years until uh, to this study by Ashworth in Monash University in Australia in 1869, he uh, showed the first time circulating tumor cells. And that's the black bile. Cancer very rarely kills you because of the primary tumor, except uh, the ones Murat deals with, uh, and because it's in the brain. And uh, typically, it kills you because it spreads. Uh, 
And uh, that spreading comes from circulating tumor cells, which is your, uh, the black bile. And he showed that uh, this is post-mortem. Cells that look exactly like the ones in the primary tumor were also in the blood circulation. So after all these years, and 142 some years uh, later, what do we know about circulating tumor cells? One thing we know, nine out of 10 deaths in cancer is because cancer spreads. So that's the cause of that. And so we need to understand better this uh, source of material that's ki uh, killing all these people. The other thing we know is uh, that uh, this is the tumor here. As soon as the tumor is tiny little bit, only maybe thickness of your hair, uh, and uh, it, it becomes vascularized. As soon as it's vascularized, uh, the blood cells start sloughing, uh, cancer cells start sloughing off from the tumor into the circulation. And if you, we were talking about, uh, Kemal Bey was talking about blood, so I brought blood. I was, I'm, I'm fully prepared. And um, it's color dye. And uh, this is what you give when you go to your physician's office. Do you have a guess how many blood cells are there in this uh, tube of blood? Billions? There are about 100 billion cells in this. And mostly, uh, and if you have uh, a sense of, uh, if you go to read the Webster Dictionary, and I counted it last night, there are 25 million words in one Webster Dictionary. That will take 4,000 Webster Dictionaries 100 billion words. If I now tell you there are 100 words in that 100 billion words that are grammatically wrong, can you find it? If you take one second to find each word, look at each word, 100 billion, it will take you 300,140 years. So we go even beyond uh, uh, Imnotep and all those guys, so it will be very long. The technology I'll show you is going to interrogate this blood in about eight to 10 million cells per second. So each second we will look at 10 million cells and say, oops, this is a cancer cell, and we will put it on the side. And um, so it's a very high throughput, and it brings engineering, uh, it brings engineering, uh, medicine, and life sciences together. We do this in this clean room. This is actually in Mass General Hospital. It's a part of our laboratory. And uh, Melis used to work in this clean room. And uh, when uh, we were having dinner a Saturday evening, and my mom is a very uh, witty woman, and she always makes these comments. And uh, so she, they're asking relatives, so what do you do? And I'm telling them, look, I work on tiny technologies, very small technologies. I'm excited telling them all the things I'm doing. And my mom says, son, can't you do something important and big with your life? <laughs> And uh, so we, we work on tiny technologies, and we do that well. And uh, she needs to be happy with that. What can I do? Here is the technology. And uh, the, this is the, let me see, there's a chip right in my pocket, right here. So it's this big. It's not very big. It's half the size of your uh, credit card. And I, I sell these if you want to buy. And, um, Ten percent for Tusk, and but uh, the way the way it works is uh, it's a chip. You take that blood I showed you with some fluidics, whatnot, push it through the chip. It goes uh, into the chip, and uh, the chip is done by, with deep reactive ion etching. It's very impressive, very accurate. We thermally oxidize it. We do all kinds of stuff. And uh, the key aspect of the chip that it has these little pillars. These pillars are about one tenth of the size of your hair. So it's about 20 micron or so. Very tiny, they are etched very accurately. They are distributed in a very special way. I'm not gonna go into details of it, but it is so that as the blood goes through this, it touches the surfaces. And uh, I'm gonna ruin my jacket, that's okay. And it touches the surface, and we put a sticky uh, protein on this, an antibody. But the sticky protein recognizes cancer cell, not the blood cell. So the blood cell touches, but it goes into garbage, waste, and the cancer cell sticks to it. The reason why we have many of these, we build redundancy so that, because these are very rare cells. It's one cancer cell in 10 billion normal uh, blood cells. So you need to have a lot of interaction. There are hundreds of thousands of these posts. So each post is interrogating only 20 cells, say 40 cells per second, but the chip interrogates uh, millions of cells per second. And then it sticks there. 
it remains there, and then we do a lot of fancy stuff with that. The next one is a video clip. You will see the chip from the top. Whole blood will go from there to here. You won't see the whole blood. We didn't label it, but we put cancer cells that we fluorescently labeled so you can get a sense of it's working. And, um, and as I said, we put a bunch of different glues that recognizes cancer. And you can see how those nicely, gently they go, and then once in a while they stick to that surface. Because there's all the hundreds of thousand posts, there's enough redundancy so that statistically we can catch these extremely rare events. And, and they stick there, and then we do all kinds of fancy stuff that I'll show you. We weren't happy with this because it is about $500 to make this chip. And so it's very expensive, and, uh, and there were other issues with it. So we went, and the plastic one. When I showed this to my brother, I have a funny, I, I should disown my family. <laughs> and uh, I showed this to my brother. He said, Mami, don't show this to anyone. It's embarrassing. It's so simple. I said, yeah. <laughs> I guess so. I love my family, nevertheless. <laughs> and so the, what this one has is, uh, we got rid of those posts because they are very difficult to engineer, manufacture, and we put some structure on top of the surface. These are herringbone structures. What the herringbone structure does is the blood goes through the chip. Instead of uh, having the post this way, it tumbles the blood in a very predictable way. And, and you can see it here. We've put a fluorescent dye, and you can see how the tumbling occurring. So we can, again, increase the interaction of the cell with the surfaces that, are, uh, uh, that have the antibody, and we capture the cell. Same principle, different chip, and we have other versions coming uh, in the uh, pipeline. And now I want to show you the black bile. This is a cancer cell uh, in a lung cancer patient. Everything I show you is uh, we don't do mice, uh, humans. They're easier to do experiments with humans. And, uh, and it is true. And that's a tumor cell. We will paint them with different colors. I won't go into too much of the details. In this one, the green uh, is a PSMA, prostate-specific membrane antigen. We want to make sure it's a, and blue is always going to be DAPI, which is the nucleus of the cell. So that uh, tells us that it's a cell. It has a nucleus. And then uh, green is uh, the cancer cell. Next to it, uh, a, a white blood cell a leukocyte uh, uh, stuck to it. And this is like uh, any time you deal with antibodies, you always have this non-specific binding. It's like uh, you, know, you go to a party, you give a party, and you, there's always one person you don't want to show up, and they show up. And that's the leukocyte, <laughs> the white blood cell. And uh, so that's the black pile. But we can do so many different. This is a pancreas cancer patient. Look at the cell. It's epithelial. It's spreading. And this is from a breast cancer patient. You see two of them right there. And uh, that's, again, a leukocyte here. And uh, so you can, you know, we can get it in different patients. This is beautiful. This is a breast cancer patient. The cell is dividing. We have stained it with a dye that's called Chi-67. If a cell is proliferating, dividing, it stains for that dye. So you can see this has that stain. So this is actually in the blood a dividing cell. Can't be too good. And uh, the next one is a prostate cancer patient. This time, epithelial cells are all like you. They are happy. They need to touch each other. They love that. They are signals that are generated when you touch each other. You live happy. And uh, if I take one of you, put in an island all by yourself, you die. Again, Greeks have a word for it, apoptosis, committing suicide. And this cell is actually committing suicide. Typically, cancer cells are epithelial. When they are shed into the blood circulation, they should be doing this. But they get some genetic mechanisms that they keep them proliferating. And I'll talk about it a little bit more. So we can get all this information. We can also stain for the RNA of these cells. And this is an extremely important slide. There are two theories about how cancer spreads. One is called EMT, and it's called epithelial to mesenchymal transition. In other words, an epithelial cell gets too uh, drunk and becomes more mesenchymal. 
And now we are finding those red dots there. We can find uh, this transition in the blood circulation. So we can analyze, understand in real patients, real cells, how these cells are transforming their phenotype from one to another one and understand the process of metastasis. This one is, uh, we are engineers, so we need to get complicated. And uh, we can only use three, four stains, different colors, typical fluorescence microscopy to look at these. Now we are doing multispectral imaging where we can look at 13 different uh, things. I won't go into details, so that we can really dissect out many of the processes that are occurring. The other theory of uh, how cancer spreads is uh, clusters. And people believe that they don't come as individual cells, but few cells together in the microcluster. And then they go into those little capillaries Murat was talking, and they're too big to get through it. They stick, and then they uh, go into the tissue. And here you see, for the first time, we started getting these uh, clusters in blood circulation. You can see it. that's a pretty nasty big cluster. And uh, you, don't, you certainly don't want that in your brain. And, um, and here you see another cluster in a prostate cancer patient. You can see four or five of them are uh, together. So you can, we can get this uh, black bile and analyze it in different ways. And it is so complicated, uh, this story, that it's going to keep us funded and uh, busy for the next 20 years. And that's one thing about scientists. By the way, Turks are smarter than Americans. And, and it's proven because in uh, uh, the United States, it's research. We search, we lose it, we research. We go back. In Turkish, it's not research. It's one term. Araştırma. We, we, we find it, it's end. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we don't say it is. <laughs> This is from a prostate cancer patient cluster, but what's important here, we are looking at different markers, PSA, PSMA, and different, mar different cells have different markers, so the phenotype is not very homogeneous. There are differences, so we're really trying to research, re -re -research this one. Uh, let me give you a few examples of applications at a very superficial level. So we have a number of clinical trials uh, to find this, not that we can find the black bile, what do you do with it? One thing you can do, you can monitor patients. Like in infectious diseases, the reason why a AIDS patient, you have the viral load, you can monitor, you can treat them at the right time. We cannot do that for cancer patients right now. So if you enumerate, count these cells as dumb as you could get for this technology, you just, oh, you have 100 cells, I'm treating you, it's zero. You're responding to treatment. Correlation is amazingly good with hundreds of patients we have done. And uh, here you see a prostate cancer patient, the tumor is there, tumor is gone, and the patient responds. So you can individually, from a simple blood test, monitor these patients. So that's one very powerful application. But we have the cells in our hands. We could do smarter things. So we can go into these cells and look at them, whether they are dividing or not, what's their phenotype, and turns out to be, to our amazement, there's a beautiful correlation in prostate cancer patients those patients that are castration sensitive, though they are responding to treatment, they have almost no cells that are dividing the black bile. On the other hand, those patients that are castration resistant, they are not doing well in treatment, and uh, half of the cells are dividing. So we, are, we can stratify the patients and decide who should have surgery versus who shouldn't have surgery. Well, we can get fancier. There are drugs called targeted therapies. In 2015, it's estimated that every cancer patient in their lifetime will be treated by a targeted uh, drug. These are very specific drugs that target very specific mutations or genetic uh, uh, defects. One is called uh, irisa gefitinib, and this is a lung cancer, non-small cell adenocarcinoma of the lung. Look at it's clocked. It disappears in six weeks. It's a magic drug for many of these patients, which is about 10% of the population. These patients are called non-smoker lung cancer, so just not smoking is not enough. Good for Turks because we smoke a lot. And, um, 
I won't go into details, but there are about eight or so mutations in the EGFR gene, epidermal growth factor receptor, and then there's a resistant gene. Uh, the darn thing is so smart, uh, T790M. So there is the, if you have these mutations, you respond to the drug. So you can take this, you can find the black bile, you can sequence or do allele-specific PCR, look whether or not they have those mutations. If they do, they put them on the uh, treatment, and then you continually sample the patient to see whether or not they express the resistance gene, 790M. This patient responded beautifully, you can see. The uh, tumor melts away. Something happens here, tumor comes back again. That's when the resistant gene is expressed. So first time, we can get genomic information and cl uh, clinical information from a single patient. Maybe the most exciting one is early detection. And uh, this is early detection, localized prostate cancer. Clinically, they're all the same. If before surgery, after surgery, we move, uh, remove their uh, prostate. And uh, PSA is high, PSA goes to zero. You remove the uh, prostate, release in stage six to seven, localized by any clinical definition. And uh, so when we looked at their circulating tumor cell, they should not have black bile in their circulation. It's localized. Well, that was, if that was the case, I wouldn't show this slide. And uh, in about one third of them didn't have it, as you expected. These are probably no vascular invasion. But the rest, almost half or so, uh, they had circulating tumor cells in their circulation. And uh, a portion, portion of them, as soon as prostate is taken out, goes down to zero, as you would expect. But a portion of them, for months, these tumor cells lingered. We believe that maybe they have honed into the bone marrow. That's where prostate loves to go. And they keep leaking, sloughing off from the bone marrow. And if you go to Sweden, you have this disease, they don't touch you. If you go to the United States, you have this disease, we take your prostate out. So two developed countries, totally different treatment regimes for the same disease. So it is possible, we have a large clinical trial now, that it is possible if this uh, prospective trial uh, pans out that maybe those that we want to operate are these, and these patients, we don't want to touch them because they don't have spreading like the other patients. So these are the type of ways we can use it. We can also do animal experiments, more painful, but I, I won't go into too much of the details, but we looked at the, all the genes that are in the primary tumor versus uh, in the uh, circulating tumor cells, and there are a number of them that look very interesting that's different, that's not in the primary tumor. Yep, that's, uh, yeah, uh, five more minutes, four minutes. The, one of them is WIN2. It is, I told you that the uh, term, the epithelial, if I put you in an island, you will die. When WIN2 is expressed and fibronectin is expressed, these cells actually survive. So we are actually finding information from animal models that show that uh, the cells are harboring mechanisms to survive when they are in a position that they should not be uh, living. And uh, so they genetically change their phenotype. And in fact, now we have this from human pancreas cancer, WIN2 is overexpressed in the circulating tumor cell, so it's closing the loop that that might be an important element. What we are doing now is a large clinical uh, trial in MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering, Mass General, and Dana Farber, and we are putting these devices in their hands, and we have about uh, five, 10,000 patient clinical trial every year for the next two years, and uh, so that we can explore the clinical applications uh, in a broader way. And uh, so from black bile to CTCs, you can monitor patients individually. Targeted therapies, you can uh, get their genomics. Your early detection is the holy grail. We can understand the biology of these cells and hopefully uh, uh, discover new biomarkers that could uh, be drug targets. With that, uh, this is the laboratory. Uh, I would like to thank to them. And, uh, I'll take your questions or later. Well, it's a really pleasure and actually honor uh, to talk about a little bit of our work. And then, of course, in every conference, you need someone who would really bring down the level so we can enjoy lunch. So that's my function here. So, and 
I think the kind of things I'll talk about are really extremely simple compared to what you have been hearing. So I want to start actually by thanking uh, my group. Uh, actually, two of them are here, Faiza and, and Abdullah, if you want to get the internal scoop about what goes on in our lab. And uh, so I get to speak about uh, you know, their efforts. So I'm very grateful to have a wonderful group of people. And actually, I was going to start talking about Genghis Khan and, uh, because we share four letters in our, in our names. But uh, since Memo beat me to date, I will actually come back to Genghis Khan if time allows later on. But tell you about uh, uh, Oskar Minkowski. And this actually allows me to start my talk with PP and then end it with poo poo. So, and this actually only to remind myself that science really only works out of curiosity. And this is actually, if you don't remember anything I said, this is really what I would like you to remember. And many things that are magnificent discoveries actually don't come out when they people say, okay, I'm going to discover something magnificent, but just out of curiosity. So this is a great example. For example, Oskar Minkowski was a Canadian surgeon. So that I think surgeons also make contributions to the world, uh, like you heard from. <laughs> and he was very curious about the, the function of the pancreas. And the way he decided to solve this was a very surgical way. So she just uh, took it out and then so uh, just observed the dogs. And then he realized that the, go the dogs started peeing a lot. And uh, actually, this pee started attracting a lot of flies. And uh, so the, the, the legend is that you know, Minkowski did not have a good smelling feeling, but he had a very keen taste. And so since he couldn't smell, the, the peculiar odor, he decided to taste the urine, and it was very sweet. So that's how the story of diabetes started. And uh, so Minkowski, of, of course, afterwards uh, led, led to work of another two Canadians, Banting and Best, who claimed the, the, uh, one of the many Nobel Prizes awarded after insulin and, and diabetes. But actually, diabetes, I start with diabetes because diabetes is just one of the cluster of chronic diseases that some of which you already heard, that constitutes the greatest risk for global public health uh, right now. And so one problem is they come as, as clusters, they don't come individually. So if you have one, you are likely, much more likely to get many others. For example, if you're obesity, you develop more type 2 diabetes. If you have that, you'll develop more cardiovascular disease. And speaking of cancer, for example, uh, obesity became the greatest driver of global cancer just by the sheer burden of uh, the disease. And again, I think when uh, Daron and Kemal was talking, uh, you know, I was thinking about you know, how these conflicting really problems are going to challenge us as we move forward. One, for example, simple statistics, this was actually compiled by David Bloom in the last World Economic Forum, I believe, that only five of these chronic diseases predicted to cost $70 trillion in the next 25 years. And so all of them actually, uh, it's, it's very difficult even to predict. So that comes to 60% of global GDP, <clears throat> obviously a, a resource that, that we don't have. And uh, I guess it is really necessary that we find some other ways to solve these problems or prevent these problems. So I'm actually going to talk uh, just one little aspect of this and mostly related to our own work but <clears throat> so in the past 25 years, we've been working on, on a, an idea that two very fundamental pathways that determine the survival, one is the metabolism and the other is the immune response, which is to defend the, the, the organism. It is a conflict between these two systems that actually relate to deterioration of many uh, systems in a chronic sense. So in some ways, this is actually a, a, a small model of aging. It's almost accelerated aging. Uh, while our uh, anticipated years are expanding, actually this is also another aspect which uh, deteriorates the quality of life. So it is, of course, when you think about metabolism and immune response, the, the relationship between these two are extremely complicated. And I want to just give this little example as three major determinants. So whether or not you're going to get sick, for example, uh, when, you are, uh, when you gain weight, or are you going to develop diabetes as you age, and so on and so forth. 
uh, among many other things, determined by first the structure of the host, and so that will be the genetic uh, material which you heard uh, about Murat. Even this uh, incredibly developed area, we don't really have a full uh, grasp of how genetic variation actually impacts uh, metabolic fate. And uh, so, again, just to go uh, to provocate uh, thinking, so if you're a geneticist, actually, we are uh, only 10% human and 90% uh, bacterial genetic material. So the second really uh, greatest contribution to what happens to us is really uh, related to the guests that live with us all our lives. So if you're actually a cell biologist, we're only 1% humans because 99% of the cells in your body are bacteria. Only 1% are human cells. So it's a humbling thought. And as Jeffrey Gordon says, for example, tonight when we go to the ambassador reception and eat those beautiful foods, you will be dining with you know, trillions of guests. And, uh, <laughs> and unfortunately, you wouldn't know many of them. And, uh, so this actually brings the, the second uh, really big determinant uh, of what happens to you under certain circumstances. Of course, the third one, uh, is, which is even uh, more poorly understood, or maybe not understood at all, are the, are the nutrients. So I have, for example, a toxicologist friend. He says, you know, if uh, nutritionists were doing toxicology, everybody will be dead. And it is, to a certain extent, true. It's a very crude and poorly developed area. but uh, another way of thinking about it is it's an area of great opportunity. So all these factors and many others actually converge to determine how a cell or a tissue actually responds to uh, energy management and control its metabolism and then send signals to coordinate how the rest of the body actually deals with this uh, stressful situation, whether that is an environmental exposure, a, a, you know, heavy food, or uh, other uh, things that we need to adapt our body. <clears throat> and then, uh, again, related to our work, I mean, there are a couple of uh, mechanisms which I'm not going to talk about, which we believe contributes. And our focus is mostly on this peculiar tissue called adipose tissue, which is the fat. It is an absolutely fascinating uh, site that controls metabolism. For many years, actually, it has been thought to have no function at all but it is turning out that this is uh, absolutely incorrect, and it, is, it has profound influence on the function of uh, many organs, including your brain, your liver, your heart, and, and, and so on and so forth. And in this tissue, actually, uh, uh, during the course of expansion, which would be, for example, gaining weight, or exposure, which will be, again, eating, uh, there are uh, cycles of stress which deteriorates the function of this. And in our lab, we call this metaflammation, in other words, metabolically induced inflammation. So things that happen when you injure yourself, but in this case, the injury actually is associated with metabolism, nutrients, energy, and, and so on. And the story started, again, I want to give just one example and, uh, and not expand the, the conversation too long. It started with a, with, a, with a model that we've developed many, many years ago when I was actually a graduate student. This was one of the very first models of genetically engineered animals. And this uh, uh, mice actually turned out to have a fantastic phenotype uh, which uh, was protecting it from every metabolic disease that we have tested. So these animals will not develop uh, obesity. For example, when you develop obesity, this is what happens to your liver, and these animals will not develop such a problem. Their blood glucose will always remain normal. They won't develop asthma. And then if we raise their cholesterol, for example, to 3,000, which will plaque the, the vessels in a normal animal, uh, their vessels will remain clear. And it's very difficult to kill these animals. So, for example, if you let them go, they are refusing to, to die while their counterparts, this is this particular group, start dying in six months and completely perish uh, within a year. So we were very curious, actually, I'm not going to talk about this today, but we were very curious, what is it? This was a particular gene present only in the fat cells. And this is at a time where fat cells did not really, people didn't think that fat cells do much uh, to uh, change the behavior of the organism and, and metabolic status. So it was going in contrast to that idea. But also, it actually told us that <clears throat> it was in these cells that something was being produced 
that controlled the behavior of other cells. So we were changing something only in the fat cells, but the liver was behaving differently, lungs were behaving differently, muscle tissue was behaving very differently. And uh, so uh, this is where uh, our story uh, started in search for this molecule or molecules coming from fat cells regulating the uh, rest of the body. And then with uh, much respect to my engineer uh, friends, I think uh, we are as much to blame. We, we think that you know, biology is very organized and you know, things uh, go quite well, you know, something like this. <laughs> so the sound is not coming, but it's, it's not a problem. Yeah, here we go. <clears throat> so things come together and form these very beautiful structures. Everything is organized. And then you end up with something like this. So of course, I mean, the, the reality is not quite like that. It's more something like this. <clears throat> So this is like my version of uh, searching a needle in the haystack. And so this is actually how your cell operates most of the time, even when you're not eating. So if you eat, for example, after the reception, you can think about this pool, and then there will be like thousands of more people wanting to enter the pool. And therefore, they're not going to be orderly. They'll be touching each other, and then they'll be annoying each other. And, so you have to manage this, so the, the, our ambassador need to call the, the security to get rid of some people, or the catering to bring more chairs or something to accommodate. So this is actually the challenge uh, in the biology. Of course, this is actually much, much worse if you're dealing with lipids. So again, I don't have time to, to cover all that, but in, in this uh, case, we have to search for a lipid in this big uh, slew, big soup of uh, many molecules. But anyway, so that actually required development of some, some uh, technology, and we were really fortunate to have the opportunity to work with a company which we helped develop this technology called uh, Lipidomics, and this is still a work in progress. And uh, so this technology can only resolve about six, 700 individual lipids and quantitatively measure. And then, uh, so we, we were actually uh, looking into all of the, the fat species that uh, tissues, and especially adipose tissue, produces. So this may actually sound like a small number, but for example, the, right now, the most powerful predictor for future chronic disease is the cholesterol measurements, for example. It is extremely, uh, it's almost a, a picture of that pool that I showed you. That's what's cholesterol measurement. Whereas within the cholesterol, there will be hundreds of different molecules, some of which have certain biology, others will have useful or harmful biologies. So this is a general goal in our lab to identify a, a better resolution of what is a lipid, what is cholesterol, and how many cholesterols are there, how many fatty acids are there, and, and so on. And can we attach a function to this? So this work was done by Haiming Chao. Now he has his own lab at the National Institutes of Health and Kristen Gerhold, who's a graduate student at Berkeley right now. And so they did this analysis with Steve Watkins, and then one thing we actually realized, again, I don't really have time to, to go over this in detail, that adipose tissue normally actually stores whatever you eat. So if you want to learn what we just had, you can take a biopsy, profile the tissue, and you will learn. But in this case, whatever we did to these animals, adipose tissue is completely agnostic to what's coming from the diet. So it, was, it almost became an autonomous republic, uh, metabolically speaking. And this actually led to a process uh, which we called uh, de novo lipogenesis, so synthesizing your own lipids. And uh, so when we profiled this, we found actually one uh, little molecule uh, with 16 carbons, one uh, with one uh, polyunsaturation called palmitoleate, or 16, 1, and 7, as I will refer to it. And uh, so this actually uh, molecule had uh, quite uh, fascinating biological activity. So if you, for example, administer this to an animal, this is just a single lipid, like a, a, a little a drop of olive oil. So if you were to f feed this lipid into an animal and then look into their muscle, so muscle tissue responds to insulin after you, uh, you eat, and then in, there is a modification on the insulin receptor which gives you the signal. And this lipid itself actually has the same capability as insulin to activate the pathway and then uh, get rid of glucose uh, from the blood. So it has an insulin-like effect on the muscle 
whereas anti-insulin-like effect on the liver, which didn't allow liver to uh, become fatty. So it was a very strong remedy against uh, fatty liver disease. And then uh, this other uh, team of fellows, Ebru Erbay, who also has her own lab now at Bilkent University, a really fantastic uh, fellow that I had the opportunity to work with, and Jared Myers, who's an MD-PhD student at Harvard, they actually uh, did a very similar analysis and they found that this lipid had a huge impact on atherosclerosis. So if you were to feed this again, in, in, put it in the food of an atherosclerotic model, there will be 50% uh, reduction in their uh, vascular lesions. So then we, again, uh, working in, in, in our environment uh, gives us opportunity to go between you know, animals and humans. So we, we actually collaborated with uh, a fellow called Dari uh, Muzaffarian and so looked whether this lipid actually had anything uh, good to do in the humans. So he actually had uh, human samples collected uh, from uh, tens of thousands of individuals where we actually correlated the presence of this lipid versus future diabetes risk, future cardiovascular risk, and so on. And uh, so this study, for example, showed that if you had uh, higher levels of this in your blood, especially in the free fatty acids component of the blood, you had about 60% reduction in your future risk for diabetes. Of course, this doesn't mean that you know, this actually itself is, is preventing diabetes, but it's an intriguing correlation that uh, having higher levels of this, of course, this will be consistent with what we're seeing in the animals, is protecting you uh, from future disease. So that actually raises uh, interesting possibilities that you know, perhaps uh, this was an ancient mechanism that was suppressed in the uh, adipose tissue. Because in humans, and I will mention this in, in, a, in a second, so uh, this pathway is completely suppressed. So in the lifetime, in a normal human being, this uh, process called de novo lipogenesis in the fat never happens. It is completely uh, turned off because we are constantly exposed to energy. So the only condition that is known that activates this pathway is chronic caloric restriction, which is also the only known way to extend your life and give you really a good health. So this actually brings me to the part of my talk where I talk about Gilgamesh. So, so this actually, uh, sorry again, uh, pass it very quickly. Uh, it's happening just by a few years, Memo, I think, uh, BC 2700. And uh, it's one of the actually most important uh, documents of uh, cultural history. And uh, they were destroyed several times, I think the last time by, by Persian. So the story that is really intriguing is taking place in Tigris and Euphrates Delta. And this story actually, I didn't come up with this story. When we published the, the, the paper, actually, discovery of this lipid in cell, actually a, a doctor from Giresun uh, emailed me the story that, that I should know about this. So uh, during the Great uh, Flood, of course, Utnapishtim survives the Great Flood. So Gilgamesh knows everything that goes around in the world, and he knows that somebody actually survived the Great Flood. So he thought this, must, this person must have found a solution to mortality. So the, the, the legend was that this person discovered the secret to immortality. So he seeks for him, he finds him, he said, okay, give me the, the secret for immortality. And he said, I don't have it, so I don't, but I can give you the secret for good health and long health. So and it was a, a local plant, and just the moment he passed this plant, a snake came, took the plant, and died into the pond. And there goes the uh, secret of immortality. This is actually why you have you know, the plant and the snake, uh, many symbols of pharmacy, medicine, toxicology, and so on. And uh, so it turns out that actually people read this, and this uh, physician from Giresun was actually one of these members of this cult that they made expeditions in search for this plant. And then, so there are some contenders for this, but I don't know, I, I'm not going to tell you what they are, but he thought that this particular one called Hippophia rhamnoides was a, a great candidate because this actually contained a very large known amount of uh, 16, 1, and 7, the same lipid that I mentioned to you. And uh, so this actually, I know some of you may <laughs> thinking that this, this sounds like a modern uh, snake oil story, but then in that case, I'd like to tell you a real uh, modern snake oil story. 
And so this is actually a paper published uh, very recently in Science and uh, working with Burmese uh, pythons. Again, you know, discovery comes from very unexpected areas. So the python is a very interesting animal. They eat huge quantities of food. For example, lunch for python is equal to one of you eating 250 kilograms of food in one sitting. And of course, this is an enormous challenge, and the, the snake needs to develop ways to, to deal with this. And one thing, for example, that happens is, this is three days after lunch, the heart of the snakes, snake actually go from this to this. So and what can be achieved by an athlete for many years of training, actually this python achieves in three days. And this is a very healthy, strong cardiac hypertrophy. And what happens during this course is, so this is the blood of actually the snake. So look what happens to the blood. Clear, and then it gets a little bit cloudy, and then it gets milky uh, around uh, two or three days, and then it clears again. So anyway, to cut this story short, these uh, investigators found a model to search what actually is this snake doing to expand its heart so quickly and so powerfully. And what actually happens is it's actually using a combination of lipids. And it requires the presence of 16, 1, and 7, the same lipid that I mentioned to you. It has to be present in order for this snake to achieve this athlete. So that brings me to, to actually uh, the story of Genghis Khan. <laughs> and uh, so Genghis Khan was actually a great, uh, you know, I think as scientists, we are so jealous of people who work on humanities since we don't have any stories to tell. So that's why I'm kind of like coming up with uh, story after story. But he was a re really fantastic conqueror. Some people know him as a brutal uh, and ruthless uh, warrior. But he built an empire ranging from Korea to Bulgaria. And he believed in, in, in three things. And actually, these are things we still haven't really quite figured out uh, to incorporate into our societies. So equality through meritocracy. So, and then equality through respect for women, he believed. So he believed in equality uh, through meritocracy, uh, respect for women. And third thing important for him was his horses. So because he thought with the horses, uh, you can uh, conquer. And actually, it's very interesting because there's a, a clear writing that he fed his horses the same plant that the, this doctor from Giresun actually emailed me. And this actually, uh, he believed that feeding these horses with hypophyr ramoides gave him actually strong hearts. And they can actually run and have huge endurance. And what is even more intriguing besides the fact that he died from an inflammatory disease, that if you look at the geography, actually, this, the three richest sources of palmitoliate actually is in, in his path. So probably as he approached Europe, he ran out of source uh, for the horses. So they actually get, start getting really exhausted. And, uh, but anyway, I think uh, really all of this uh, brings me to uh, the hope that could there be really possibilities to, to produce new ways of preventing or treating disease? And why is this important? I think uh, that I'll go back to my, the, be, the beginning of my talk and uh, kind of uh, bring this issue. So I already told you that you know, chronic non-communicable diseases, or just five of them, cost huge amount of money. In the next 30 years, 70 trillion. So the conflict here is that there are no medicines, unlike cancer. There are no new medicines coming into the market. The last time we had a cardiovascular disease drug was 30 years ago. And it, it, we don't even know how it works. And then we lost uh, at least two or three very effective diabetes drugs. And there has been only one obesity medicine approved. And that's only recently. And that's a new version of an old drug. So there is clearly a, a difficulty here. And we need uh, new strategies to overcome this. And part of this actually was the reason I asked what I asked uh, Daron, because everybody wants new medicines. Nobody actually wants to develop diabetes or, or cardiovascular disease or neurodegeneration. But at the same time, nobody also wants to take any risk. So there is absolutely no tolerance for any risk for a disease or for a drug that you will have to use for all your life. So this conflict is a very, very difficult uh, one to resolve. And this is actually plaguing the, the pharmaceutical industry right now. So uh, I decided to talk about this aspect of my work, 
because maybe it is, uh, there is an avenue, for example, making drugs out of nutrients. And so this actually would be uh, much, much safer. So it will address the, the concerns of safety. Of course, we don't know the issues about efficacy. So can we uh, extract and find uh, sufficiently efficacious uh, molecules out of nutrients? At least it is more pleasant than, for example, what I mentioned to you in the middle of my talk, that you, know, you live with trillions of guests. And these actually uh, organisms live in your gut. And you can change this. But it takes, at least at the moment, something like this. So if we can actually make drugs out of food, it could be a little bit more uh, pleasant. So this is actually Bear Gillis in the, in the Man vs. Wild. So he gets thirsty, and then he takes a fresh elephant dong and squeezes to drink the water out of it. So in, in medicine, actually, this is called microbiota reconstitution or fecal transplantation. So if you don't want to undergo this procedure, I think uh, I will recommend you to you know, eat carefully and live carefully for the moment. And thank you very much for listening. And I think only good food will be served in the reception. Thank you.